Welcome everyone to Big Astronomy Live Meet Alma. My name is Renee Kerrigan. I'm a member of the Big Astronomy Leadership Team, and I'm very happy to have you all here today. Big Astronomy is a National Science Foundation funded project that is all about the people it takes to make big science and big astronomy happen. It consists of a planetarium show that is showing in planetariums around the world um, and also showing online uh, about the National Science Foundation funded telescopes and observatories in Chile, but more importantly about all the people that work at those telescopes. You can find out more information at bigastronomy.org. If you are joining us in Zoom today, make sure that you select what language you would like to hear at the bottom of the Zoom window. That will allow you to hear it in either English or Spanish. And please do keep yourself muted during the program, which will help with our language interpretation. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them in the comments, either on our Facebook Live event or here in the Zoom webinar. But I'm very happy now to introduce our speaker today, Loreto Barcos Menuntz, who will be speaking about the ALMA Observatory and everything that it takes to make big discoveries happen at ALMA. Thank you for being here, Loreto. Thank you very much, Renee, for the invitation. It's always a pleasure to talk about um, ALMA. So, uh, as, I, uh, as Brenda said, my name is Loreto, and I work at the National Radio Astronomy Observatory, or NRAO. Uh, and I'm part of, a, particularly, I'm part of the North American ALMA Science Center. So I work for ALMA here in Charlottesville, Virginia. So uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, ALMA. And um, uh, give me a second. All right. And so ALMA, for, uh, for those of you who don't know, ALMA is a telescope uh, and its name, it stands for Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array. Uh, so as its name says it, it's located in Atacama, in the Atacama Desert in Chile, Northern Chile. Uh, it's very large. It has 66 antenna, high precision, reconfigurable antennas that work together uh, to give us unprecedented capabilities at these uh, wavelengths, millimeter and submillimeter. And I'm gonna explain uh, later what I mean with millimeter and submillimeter wavelengths. Um, so ALMA is, uh, uh, since it's very large, uh, it requires actually a partnership between uh, uh, different uh, uh, communities uh, uh, to make this happen. And so these are the uh, NRAO, uh, uh, the observatory for, uh, that I work for, uh, the European Southern Observatory, or ESO, in Europe, <clears throat> and the National Astronomy Obser uh, Astronomical Observatory in Japan for East A representing East Asia. And of course, in partnership with uh, Chile. So in total, there are 21 countries involved. So why ALMA exist? So how ALMA uh, basically came uh, to be? Oh, and we have a poll. We have a poll. Uh, so have you heard of ALMA before? If you can answer yes or no, uh, maybe I'm going to answer no. <laughs> yes, of course. Um, all right, so um, ALMA, um, started in the 80s as an idea and as a need. So the community, the scientific community, astronomers around the world identified the need to have something like ALMA, a radio telescope that with many antennas working in the millimeter, submillimeter regime. Uh, and so independently, each, uh, each community here, NAOJ, ESO, and NRAO started thinking about uh, creating something like ALMA. However, quickly they realized that handling but their, their themselves, each one individually, is not, it was not gonna be possible because this is a huge telescope. They were thinking uh, uh, big, right? And so since they all had the same, the common uh, 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 interest, they decided to join forces. 
And so they started looking for a place. And then in 1995, they tested several places. And I'm going to uh, mention uh, uh, next uh, uh, what those places were and why. Uh, but in 1995, uh, they uh, did some tests uh, uh, on atmospheric conditions uh, in Chile, in the Atacama Desert, and they were very, very happy with the results. And later on in 1999, they decided to build ALMA in Chile. So uh, a few years passed and the first stone was placed. Uh, and during all this time, there was, uh, there was a lot of design, of course. Um, a, a lot of effort behind constructing this uh, and also the logistics, right? To bring every single antenna from the different part of the world. Uh, so from, uh, yeah, from different part of the world to uh, here in Atacama. And so uh, in 2009 was the first antenna installed uh, and then formally uh, they inaugurated online 2013, although uh, formal observations started in 2011. Um, and then in 2014, the last antenna was installed. Uh, excellent. And since then, um, has done extremely uh, extraordinary, has done extraordinary uh, observations that, that had led to extraordinary result, results. All right, so, but uh, where exactly is ALMA and why? So ALMA, it's in, the, in South America, in Chile here, and here I'm zooming in into the Northern uh, part of Chile. Uh, so here's Santiago, the capital, and here is the mountains, the Andes, uh, across the entire country. Uh, and Alma is located uh, uh, close to the Atacama, uh, in the Atacama Desert, uh, along the uh, Andes. And in particular, the, antenna, the antennas are located uh, in, in what we call the array operation site that is at 5,000 meters uh, in elevation. Uh, and it, it, they, uh, the important thing about that place is that it's not only that it's uh, very high, which is important, and I'm going to explain uh, briefly why it's so important that it's high, but also because they found this plateau, right? So this vast area, flat area, where they could put this uh, telescope, right? They needed something large and flat where they could put the antennas uh, and distribute the antennas, move the antennas around, and even as far apart as 16 kilometers. So right now they can separate the antennas as far as 16 kilometers uh, apart. And so they found this plateau that is called the Chagnantor Plateau in the Chilean Andes, in, which is one of the driest places on earth. And here, uh, it, this is a, a view from space uh, of that part of Chile indicating where Alma is. And you can see how not only the place Alma is, but also all the north uh, skies in Chile, it's very, very clear. And we have these conditions uh, for a good part of the year, uh, fortunately. And that's due to, of course, the ocean plus the Andes uh, working in favor of astronomy in this case. Um, in particular, uh, having high altitude is super important for astronomy, in particular, especially for ALMA and uh, the telescopes that work uh, in the millimeter to millimeter regime, because water vapor actually distorts the signal and uh, makes the atmosphere more opaque uh, and uh, distorts the signal and becomes more harder to, to observe. Uh, and so here the, uh, the, is a picture comparing the different observatories across the, the world, uh, many of them uh, uh, in Chile. And this gray area is indicating uh, how much uh, atmosphere you have and so and how more transparent is becoming as you go up in altitude. And so you really can see how ALMA, it's really, really high, uh, uh, um, uh, high and has less atmosphere above it. Uh, still, of course, uh, the weather, uh, uh, we have bad weather sometimes, but most of the time it's really good weather. Um, all right, so that is the antennas. So the antennas are uh, at 5,000 meters in elevation. And here's a picture, a cool picture from uh, the almakids.org uh, webpage. Uh, and they show here how they depict San Pedro de Atacama, which is a town nearby, uh, and Toconao as well. This area is super touristic. Uh, there are valleys and, and ge uh, geysers uh, that I recommend visiting uh, uh, whenever we can go back to a more normal life. Um, and uh, so the antennas are at 5,000 meters in elevation. 
But then all the uh, uh, operations, most of the operations are done here at 3,000 uh, uh, meters of elevation in the Operation Support Facility, or OSF. This is where we observe, this is where we sleep when we go there, etc. And then this is, of course, this is in the north, and then in Santiago, and, uh, and sorry, I forgot to mention here, is a, a picture of the offices. So here is where the control room is, uh, the uh, laboratories, um, safety uh, uh, people work here as well. We have uh, people that, uh, nurses that check your, your health whenever you have to go up, et cetera. And then in Santiago is where we have the offices and archive and et cetera. Uh, at the uh, headquarters of the Joint Alma Observatory in Santiago. And if you're familiar with the area, this is in, in Vitacura. Um, and here it's great. So I had the opportunity to work here for two years and actually go to the OSF. I got to visit the antennas, but I don't, I'm not gonna talk about that experience uh, uh, today, but I'll be happy to uh, answer your questions if you're curious about how it's to, to go. Uh, on a shift to the observatory. But here, these offices is great. We have, uh, so ESO, NAOJ, and NRAO is what we call ALMA Regional Center, so the ARCs. And we get to share uh, and interact with people from all over the world here. It's, it's an amazing place to work uh, with all different cultures and different people. It's, it's amazing. All right, but so that is uh, a little bit about uh, the, place, uh, but I want to uh, tell you a little bit more about ALMA itself, about the telescope. Uh, and one thing is that uh, we need to understand what, what it sees and what I mean with submillimeter and millimeter wavelengths, right? So when we talk about wavelengths, we are talking about the wavelength of the light that we're seeing. So uh, here I'm showing you the electromagnetic spectrum, which is a fancy word for light. And here I'm showing you that there are different types of light. All right, so we normally observe in the, vis in the visible uh, regime. So what we call the visible light, uh, all right? And so we see colors, et cetera, like the Hubble Space Telescope or, or HST. HST is in this regime, right? And we learn about uh, the things in the universe in this regime. However, there are many other regimes that we call invisible light because we don't see it with our eyes that include the ultraviolet, like the light that comes from the sun that harms our skin. That's what we need, the sunscreen, et cetera, x-rays, gamma rays, which are the energetic side of the light. Now, more or less energetic sides are the infrared. So for example, any object that has some temperature will glow in the infrared. And so uh, we see bright things are hot, that, that are, uh, have some temperature, we see them in an infrared, like the night vision, right? And then ALMA sees in this regime, which is the uh, submillimeter, millimeter. So it touches a little bit of the infrared, but goes mostly to the microwaves and radio waves that we call. And, and we see different things. And I'm gonna show you here an example, all right? And why it's so important to observe things with these different types of eyes, right? Different telescopes. So here's, I'm showing you a galaxy called Centaurus A, uh, and this is what we see in the visible light. This was taken in La Silla, one of the telescopes in Chile, uh, observing at, you know, visible light. Like this is what we would see if we look with our eyes. Uh, and so you see that there in the background, there is some light from the stars. And then you see these more obscure things that we call a dust lane. Uh, now, if we go and see in the infrared, we don't see much of the light from the stars, but we do see the dust blowing. That means that the gas is being heated by the light of these stars and is absorbing that light and re-emitting it. So in the infrared, blowing in the infrared. This was the state taken by uh, Spitzer. Um, and now if we go to ALMA here, uh, you need to focus in the cyan and magenta colors. And this is telling you the distribution of gas in this galaxy. Gas is basically the material from where from which stars are formed. And so this is telling you that there is not there is material to form stars here in this galaxy. Uh, now if we go to uh, radio, uh, we see something completely different, right? This is uh, you wouldn't have thought that this was was here if you would have looked at it just with you know your eyes. Uh, 
And in radio, you see this huge jet, the same with Chandra in x-rays, you know, you see something uh, different. And then combining this image, you know, you see the full picture. But actually to understand what is happening with these galaxies, you need to understand each different component and, and see the whole picture. So if we look just with, you know, the visible light, we would be missing all these extra things that are happening in the galaxy. And so uh, it's super important to see uh, 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 with different eyes what is happening in, in, in uh, the different objects in the, in the universe. Alma in particular sees the gas and cold, very cold dust, so colder than this which tell us a little bit about the star formation and how uh, these galaxies evolve. Um, so how does ALMA get their uh, observations? So uh, ALMA has 66, 66 antennas, as I mentioned, which give it 10 to 100 times more sensitivity than the previous uh, uh, radio telescopes uh, that we had. And so 66 antennas makes your uh, telescope really sensitive to faint emission, faint light. Uh, the telescopes are uh, in two, come in two sizes. We have 54 of them that measure uh, uh, 12 meters in diameter, that have uh, 12 meter in diameter. And here's an image showing you for context, this is a human size versus, you know, okay, this antenna is lift up, lifted up, but still, you know, it's a huge antenna. And this is the transporters that were custom made to transport these antennas. So uh, I've been telling you a lot of things that imply, so all these things were created basically custom made for this telescope. This telescope is a state of the art, has a state of the art technology. Uh, it has receivers uh, here that work in this regime, in these frequencies uh, that are extremely sensitive. They have to be cooled down to four degrees uh, 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 Fahrenheit, uh, so very, very cold, sorry, uh, Kelvin, so that they are very, very cold, so they are very sensitive to very faint light. Uh, and we can move these antennas around uh, and they can take up to 192 different positions. Uh, in the maximum separation that you can get between them is 16 kilometers and the minimum uh, maximum separation is 150 meters. So something very compact and something very big. And so here, so these uh, movable uh, uh, positions allow you to get 100, 10 to 100 times better angular resolution compared to the previous telescopes that we had at these millimeters to millimeter wavelengths. All right, so uh, here I'm showing you a schematic view of the different places that these antennas can take. And this is just to show you, you know, how many combinations we can get. So all these gray and uh, uh, blue points uh, represent a possible position for an antenna. And this red means that the antennas are in those positions. So here I'm showing you the most compact configuration that we can get the telescopes in. Uh, with the maximum separation between them uh, of 150 meters. And this allows you to not get much resolution, right? You won't see much detail, but you will see very large uh, extended emission like the ones I showed for Centaurus A in radio. You can detect those things. Now, if you change this to the antennas and spread them apart, you know, they can take up to, this is, uh, in this case, I'm showing you one configuration with a maximum separation between antennas of 13 kilometers. And these, uh, uh, the power of this uh, configuration is that you can see very, very detailed things. So, for example, with this configuration, you could distinguish a golf ball at a distance of 15 kilometers. That's really, really powerful. All right, so how does it observe is that these uh, 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 antennas receive an incoming signal here depicted in uh, yellow arrows that uh, hit the main, uh, uh, the primary reflector and then they go to the secondary uh, reflector and then put them back into the receiver or the front end. This is where all the receivers are. Uh, this is where it has to be very, very cold. Uh, and then all the signal is uh, 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 carried out to uh, the correlator, which is the supercomputer that we have up there at 5,000 meters. So the correlator actually 
is the most powerful computer at high altitude uh, uh, in the world. There are more powerful computers, but not at this altitude. Um, and then, so the correlator, it's key uh, for this. This is called what we call a radio interferometry. So detecting signal from each one and then combining them. The correlator does all the hard work and synchronize all the signals to make them you know, valuable. And then they send it to uh, the 3000 meters in the OSF. They archive it and then they send it to Santiago for operation. So they calibrate the data and then we can do science with it. All right, so who uses ALMA? Uh, so here is a map, a world map of all the people that submitted proposals in cycle five. So cycle five is basically uh, the fifth cycle or the sixth cycle actually, because it started with cycle zero, the fifth cycle that people could propose to observe for ALMA. So the way it works is that uh, people from all over the world, scientists uh, send a proposal uh, and say, I want to use, I want this amount of hours of ALMA time to observe this object because this object is super cool and it's going to produce exciting discoveries and so give me time. And if they like your proposal, they give you time. And in this case, in cycle five, there were 16 and almost 1700 people submitting proposals, ideas to observe with ALMA. Out of these, uh, only 25% uh, of them get time at different priorities. Uh, this number has increased with time and we're, we are at 1800 proposals submitted. And again, out of those, uh, something about like 400 get time or something like that. Uh, it's a very, very competitive uh, 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 process and many people wanna use it because it's groundbreaking, it's producing gr groundbreaking uh, science. Uh, it's so powerful. We haven't seen this guy with these eyes before, with this sharpness, with this sensitivity. Um, and so people normally request between few hours up to, you know, more than 50 hours. Uh, in general, they propose more for 15 to 20 hours. So uh, that's the amount of hours. And in total, uh, uh, Alma has something like 4,000 4, hours to, to observe. Now, as you can see, Alma's is a huge observatory and it requires a lot of people. Uh, and it requires everyone basically from, you know, astronomers like me to engineers in mechanical, in mechanical engineers, computer engineer, software engineers. Uh, we need people that handle human resources and all the logistics that implies working in an international uh, uh, facility. Uh, Alma leaves for their discoveries and uh, make them approachable to the community with these uh, talks. So me speaking to you today or in, in the press releases and all that. And so they need people, graphic designers, scientific journalists to work on that. Uh, you can imagine that going uh, to 3,000 meters and 5,000 meters has some safety requirements, right? And so we need people that knows about safety to work uh, at the, in the observatory. Uh, here I'm showing you in the middle, this is the residency where we stay when we go on shifts. And uh, you can imagine you need people that know about hospitality and all the logistics involved. Like we get picked up from the uh, airport and bring here and we need a room. And so someone has to take care of all that logistics. Uh, I mentioned the nurses or people that, you know, take your vitals if you're going up to 5,000 meters, they need to make sure that you're, you're, you're good, help, you're healthy uh, to go up there, et cetera. So more than 250 people work for Alma just in Chile. Uh, and there are 250 more working uh, across the different regional centers. Um, all right, and all of this is to produce results like this. So I'm gonna finish with a few results, the most remarkable ones uh, that Alma has produced. And I hope many of you have seen this image already, uh, but this is the first image of the shadow of a supermassive black hole in a nearby galaxy in M87. This was made because of a combination of telescopes, including ALMA. Uh, and here I'm showing you how crucial ALMA was. So this is the image that they got with all the antennas involved. And this is what they would have gotten if they wouldn't have included ALMA in, in a single dish apex, but probably ALMA is the, the, the one that is driving, driving this uh, uh, result. So extremely important. So ALMA has also, 
uh, helped uh, a lot to shape the protoplanetary disk community uh, in the results. So this is uh, results, these are uh, observations of uh, uh, protoplanetary disks. So disks that are in the future are gonna produce planets. So in the, in the center, you have a star that is surrounded by a disk of gas and dust that potentially will you know, coagulate and start forming planets. Uh, and this is what they had to work with before ALMA, and this is after ALMA. So I'm gonna go back and forth a little bit so that you can see. Maybe you can focus here. This is the first protoplanetary disk that was released with uh, uh, the powerful ALMA. So this was done with all these antennas separated uh, so that they could get the best resolution. And so this is what they got. And so before they had a blob, right? And now they have all these little rings that are potentially being formed by uh, protoplanets. So this is pretty exciting. In fact, uh, a group of people were giving uh, more than 50 hours into what we call a large program. And you can ask me later for more details, but uh, basically uh, they got time to observe 20 of these systems and not those handful that I showed earlier. Uh, and they found all these different types of uh, uh, features, even, you know, spiral learns, uh, disks, uh, there are some binaries, uh, et cetera. Uh, the same happened with a large program now to observe nearby galaxies. So this is the FANGS ALMA project. FANGS stands for physics at high angular resolution in nearby galaxies. So they are able to actually understand how the gas, this gas that I was showing for Centaurus A, now looks like this in nearby galaxies. And this is the quite similar quality to HST, the Hubble Space Telescope. So the Hubble Space Telescope is the best we can do right now with optical, uh, in the optical regime, in the visible light. Now ALMA is giving us the best view for the gas in these systems. And so combining both is gonna give you this multi-wavelength view much needed to understand what is happening, you know, how the stars are forming, uh, you know, in these different types of uh, galaxies. All right, many of you heard of the phosphine detection in the Venus uh, atmosphere. Uh, so here I'm showing you, this is a, a picture of Venus from an orbiter, a Japanese orbiter. Uh, with a, a, a spectral line profile uh, generated by a single uh, telescope, uh, the James Clark Maxwell Telescope in uh, Mauna Kea. Uh, and then in, in orange is the spectrum generated by ALMA. So ALMA can tell you whether or not you have certain molecules. So you saw before the uh, gas, but here uh, the images, but now you're seeing the actual signature of, uh, in this case, phosphine. Uh, now, this is not, this is a possible, so uh, I want to clarify that this is a possible marker of life, but it's not, we, they haven't ruled out that this can, this, you know, they need more uh, 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 theory and more observations to actually say something, whether or not phosphine, this phosphine detection has something to do with life or not. Uh, and here I'm showing you a picture of Venus with ALMA in the same spectrum. So ALMA sees Venus this way, uh, like this. All right. And then uh, recently uh, we've seen uh, the, an image release where uh, results from another large program uh, that is observing M-type stars. So a type of stars that we know will evolve into uh, uh, planetary nebula, and they have found uh, these little shells of gas uh, uh, going away. Uh, so the red is going away from us, the blue is coming towards us, and they've seen this, the kinematics of these shells. And they have found that the culprit of this uh, is uh, companions. So they, uh, these observations are uh, advancing the knowledge we have on star evolution. So, and with that, uh, there are many, many more uh, uh, um, uh, discoveries I, I haven't discussed with you today, but uh, uh, trust me that there are many more to come. So thank you very, very much for, for watching. And um, Renee, I'd be happy to take questions. Wonderful, thank you for that presentation. Alma has been involved in so many fantastic 
discoveries and and like you uh, mentioned some of the biggest news stories uh, that we have had in astronomy, especially the Venus um, phosphine uh, discovery and then of course helping to image the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy it's hard to imagine something more exciting than that. Um, so we have had a few questions. Uh, one question is, what is the most recent major discovery or observations being done? Which you did just go over some um, recent discoveries, but perhaps you could speak to, um, are there observations currently happening at ALMA right now, even during the shutdown? Yeah, so thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, so as you know, working, so making ALMA work is extremely hard and, and requires a lot of people. And since the pandemic, you know, you cannot have many large groups. And so we've been closed up until a few weeks ago, where they we are slowly starting up to you know op to open things but right now we're not taking observations we stopped uh mid-march and uh if we're lucky maybe we can go back in next march you know but there are many many little pieces i need to work uh, before before that happens but yeah we're not taking observations and not receiving any visitors right now which you can if you know in a normal time you can go visit the osf there is another question that just came in on Facebook. Claudia wants to know, how do you involve Latino students uh, with ALMA? That's nice. So there are many um, efforts done from the education and public offices uh, at NRAO, uh, in, in Chile at JAO by AUI, which is the Associated Universities Inc. Uh, this is the company that uh, handles, you know, all the uh, logistics of the JAO, the, the Joint ALMA Observatory. And I'm sorry I'm giving so much JAO and AUI, but that's how astronomy normally goes. Um, uh, but yeah, so uh, there, are, there are some uh, uh, efforts done to include students in general, uh, specifically in Chile. But I would say uh, you, uh, so NRAO has the um, so NRAO has some some uh, uh, efforts for uh, minorities, uh, etc. But unfortunately, it's just in the U.S. For Latinos, I would say if Chilean right AUI has something to offer. I know that there are people uh, working in Central America to mentor students. Uh, I'd say the easiest thing to do would be to contact people. So sometimes uh, if you're a student and you want to work on a research project as an undergraduate, I'm, I'm talking about university, uh, you can contact people at the different places and see if they have something to offer you, but it will be not uh, through a formal uh, process though, more like just approaching someone. Susie wants to know, what is your area of research? Oh, nice. Thank you, Susie. I love talking about my research. Unfortunately, I didn't include anything, but it's more related to this. And maybe you catch my enthusiasm when I talked about these results here. Um, so I study galaxies, uh, not like this uh, particularly, but galaxies are interacting. Uh, and I, I, they, they normally, because of the interaction, they produce a lot of the stars. And so they really glow in the infrared, but also they really glow uh, uh, um, uh, in, uh, they, they have a lot of gas. And so they really glow with ALMA as well when we look for gas. And so uh, they require, they are sometimes very compact. And so this extended configuration of ALMA, the exquisite angular resolution is perfect for my science, for example. Thank you, Susie, for that question. Well, and I have a question. Yeah. Uh, what is your favorite part of your job, Loretto? So the best part of my job, actually, uh, it's uh, an example of that uh, is this result here. So I got to be there when they were observing this. So it was so exciting uh, to know that I was being part, like very tangentially, right? But I had a, a, some small, you know, uh, uh, um, 
contribution to these results. So I guess helping people do their science is really rewarding for me uh, because uh, uh, even if it's not my science, you know, I have a love for uh, astronomy and discoveries and learning about the universe. And so helping people doing do that, I think it's, it's very rewarding. So I love that. And there's one more question that came in from Andrew. Do you have data to, you meaning Alma, I believe, have data to analyze when there are no new observations being made? Absolutely. Thank you very much for that question. That is an excellent question. So. Every time Alma observes, uh, the data gets it stored and uh, can only be downloaded or the only people that can work with is the group that proposed for it. But that lasts one year. So after one year, uh, all the data becomes public and anyone can download it. In fact, uh, we are trying to push for, you know, uh, uh, something similar to uh, HSD that they have archival proposals. So they, it's proposals the same way that you propose to observe with Alma. You actually propose to use their archive and eventually get some funding uh, uh, doing that. Uh, and so Alma has the same archive and we've been operating for seven cycles already. And so uh, uh, there are data that is in the archive public for anyone that, can, that wants to download it. Well, I just checked in. I don't see any more questions either on Facebook or uh, in our Zoom webinar. Um, so I'd just like to say thank you so much for your time, Loretto, for uh, speaking with us today, for preparing this presentation. And thank you to uh, Sebastian for doing our simultaneous translation. If you're watching on Facebook, just a note that this is available uh, also as a Zoom webinar. So if uh, you would like to have translation from Spanish to English or English to Spanish, um, you can log into the link and you'll be able to hear the conversation in your language for uh, upcoming events that way. And speaking of upcoming events, next week on October 20th at uh, 1 p.m. Chile time, noon Eastern Daylight Time and 9 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time, we'll be having another similar program, Big Astronomy Live Meet Vera Rubin Observatory. So the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope has been christened the Vera Rubin Observatory. It's going to be the next big observatory coming online soon. Um, the whole astronomy world is excited about that. So I'm excited to learn from Dr. Amanda Bauer about that facility. And you can tune in on the same ways you did today by joining our Zoom webinar or by watching on Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us. Please feel free to uh, share these videos with anyone you might know who's interested in STEM careers or astronomy. You can always find out more at our website, which is www.bigastronomy.org and see if a planetarium near you is either showing or streaming the Big Astronomy film uh, and check out all the other great resources that are available on our web portal. So one more big thank you uh, to Loreto and, and um, we hope to see you again soon at Big Astronomy. Thank you very much. Thank you for watching.